Um, I'm Matt Doringer. I'm the editor-in-chief of the Duke Forum for Law and Social Change. And uh, on behalf of the, the Duke Law School and the Duke Forum for Law and Social Change, I'd like to welcome you to this morning. Thanks for braving the weather and making it here. Um, we're really excited about this conference, and I think it's a really important issue. And I think that the support that we've received so far and the turnout today is reflective of how important this issue is. Um, last year, when we had been trying to select a theme for this year, we had uh, sort of been kicking around several different things from homelessness to health care to issues of poverty. And this issue didn't come up until sort of very late in the process. Um, one of our one of our stat one of our editors suggested the issue of sort of discrimination and against Muslims and those perceived to be Muslims in the United States, and immediately the the theme just resonated with all of our staff, and it was sort of that that moment when we realized this this has to be the theme for next year. Um, we sort of in researching it and even at that moment realized that this was a topic that received a lot of attention. Um, immediately following the events on September 11th, but that since that time, well, the level of discussion had certainly died down. These issues had really st are still part of, of society, and that if we weren't having these open and uh, constructive discussions, that we really, as a country, ran the risk of having these problems embedded in the, the core of American society. And we thought that this could be uh, one step and one part of that conversation. So we have brought together uh, scholars and professionals from across the country today to share with you some of their perspectives. And I'm hoping that you all can share some of your perspectives and be part of the conversation uh, as well. Um, to, to get things started, we have, uh, we're fortunate to have with us uh, Duke University's first Muslim chaplain, Mr. Abdullah Antepli. And he's going to speak a little bit about his experiences as a university chaplain dealing with these type of issues and also some of the opportunities he sees to overcome these issues. So please uh, give a warm welcome for Mr. Antepli. Good morning. And I greet you with the universal Muslim greeting. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. I think one of the practical results of this conference should be to know what is this universal Muslim greeting. There's no blackboard to write. Okay, repeat after me. Assalamu alaikum. And in response, you say, wa alaikum salam. So I will greet you, you greet me back. Assalamu alaikum. Wow, this is a quick learner group. <laughs> This is a wonderful icebreaker for Muslim colleagues, friends, neighbors. It will take you a few steps ahead in the conversation. It's a wonderful thing to know. But these days, don't try at the airport. <laughs> and I don't, know, I don't know whether to laugh or later to cry to, to this joke, unfortunately. It's neither to weep nor to laugh kind of situation where anything as innocent as peace be upon you or peace be onto you could be a source of uh, tension, anxiety on a U.S. airport, uh, and you could receive additional care and attention, which I often do. Uh, just two months ago, when I was about to board my flight, I was throwing these Arabic words, Assalamu alaikum, mashallah, alhamdulillah, kifak, shuak, barak, and then the next thing I know, I was about to just miss my flight because I've been taken care of by a nice gentleman who know almost nothing about Islam <laughs> and thought those conversations meant some sort of a threat to them. I really admire and take my hats off for the people who organize this uh, prophetic, as I call it, I'm an imam, so I can get away with anything I say. <laughs> uh, prophetic to me, a timely conversation to talk about the new face of discrimination. And I really appreciate the forum for bringing up this important social disease and a new challenge and a new homework to uh, American society, to Western society in general. But the way the title of the conference being phrased is really speaks to the heart of the matter. New face of discrimination. Islamophobia, as we always, as I frame it, is not known yet. It is not necessarily coined and it's not part of the collective consciousness of American society, but that's what we are dealing with. Islamophobia, an unfounded, unbased fear of Islam and Muslims. Anything sounding Islam, anything sounding Muslim, bringing fear to the people's heart and, and anxiety, etc. But again, 
This is the new face of discrimination, Islamophobia, what we are going to discuss here the whole day and try to understand and grow, is nothing new. It's nothing new, and in that sense, it's very similar to the anti-Semitism, homophobia, racism that we, this society and the global society have dealt in the, in the past. To keep this issue, discrimination towards Islam and Muslims as a unique issue, an isolated issue, something related to Islam and Muslims would be missing the mark entirely. We just have to discuss this matter as a human problem. This problem has showed itself in different faces, in different forms, in different shapes, in other times with different communities. Unfortunately, we human beings have need an enemy to exist in some, in some certain settings. And it's not entirely pointless. Defaming, dehumanizing uh, a certain particular group of people somehow serves to the interest of some people. It justifies certain foreign policies. It justifies certain domestic policies. It, it certainly justifies certain economic policies, which I will not get into that. <laughs> but it's a growing concern, and it's a growing issue. And it should be understood as a human problem and discussed in the human problem as well. But ongoing association of Islam and Muslims after the uh, second uh, Gulf War, after the first Gulf War, but especially after 9-11, is a growing concern. And unfortunately, you would think since 9-11, it's been eight years, things have changed, books are sold, conferences are being made, things are getting better. As someone who is working in the grassroots level, who is working with people individually and collectively, I just came from a, a training session from Duke Hospital, where I was conducting a training about uh, raising the awareness about Islam and Muslims to an educated group of people. But things are getting a lot worse. Things are getting a lot worse, and I am really hoping that as the previous challenges like anti-Semitism, homophobia, and racism, unfortunately, we had relative success in dealing with those issues until things get really, really ugly. And I'm really hoping and praying that this will not be the case for our, de for our dealing of Islamophobia. Why things are worse, you know? After 9-11, people were upset, people were confused, they were questioning and things like that. You may like it or not like it. Who doesn't know here the Karl, Karl Rowe? Karl Rowe? Is it my Turkish accent getting in the way? <laughs> Karl Rowe. You may like it or dislike it. I dislike him very much. But he's a genius. He's a genius public image maker. He keeps repeating one thing to the entire team all the time. He's telling that what you are trying to convey to people, what you are trying to convey to the society, the message that you are trying to sell doesn't have to be true. It doesn't have to be backed by scientific information. It doesn't have to be accurate. You just have to repeat enough number of times. Once you repeat enough number of times, even the most educated, most enlightened, most progressive, most peaceful people, they may not necessarily buy the entire message, but they will come close to it. So since 9-11, Islam is evil, Muslims are terrorists, Muslims are archaic, primitive, uh, uh, revengeful, angry people who oppress women, who are anti-gay, and then their values and way of life is not reconcilable with the Western Judeo-Christian civilization, has been repeated enough number of times that it is no more a, an idea or a claim. It started sinking as a reality in the hearts and minds of many people. And God forbid, if something like 9-11, God forbid, happen again, you will never know what that sinking of reality will turn into, what kind of actions it will, it will, it will reveal into as we, as we learn from our previous human challenges of anti-Semitism, homophobia, and racism in the past. There's a Turkish redneck joke. I'm from Turkey originally, as you can tell. A Turkish redneck sees a banana peel on his walkway, huge banana peel. And he says, shoot, I'm going to fall again. <laughs> and my excitement and my invitation to all of you is, let's just not fall again. Let's just not see a banana peel, step on it, and fall again. Let's learn from our previous mistakes. And hopefully, before it gets really, really ugly, it gets really, really ugly. You cannot imagine how painful how painful to be a Muslim chaplain on this campus and see 17, 18 years old kids who made it to Duke. Their parents came to this country as broke graduate students. And then they realized the American dream. They live in a $1 million home in the suburbs. Their parents can pay full tuition to send their daughter and son to Duke University. And they themselves scored high SAT test. It's not easy to get to Duke, as you all know. We try to get the cream of the crop. But yet, but yet not feeling not feeling the entire pride that they deserve to feel. 
not because of what they have done, but because of who they are. It is painful to facilitate some of the Duke students changing their names from Muhammad, Abdullah, Hassan, Hussein to Jonathan, Harry, from Fatima, Aisha to Carolyn, not because they don't like those names, but what are the things that have been associated on a daily basis in, in, in irresponsible media to those names? They don't want to, they don't want to go through caught this crap anymore. It is a painful, it's really painful, and I'm just trying to convince you what is at stake, to be a father of an eight years old girl coming home at least two, three times a week in her own wording, asking to her, her father, Baba, are you sure it's okay to be Muslim? It's a cool thing to be Muslim. Are you sure it's a fun thing to be Muslim? That's not how I feel. The feel and the taste in the, in the air about Islam and Muslim is not, not necessarily very fun, very cool, very tasty. And this is a human challenge. And we, we have a responsibility, all of us have a responsibility uh, to basically challenge, basically to challenge this responsibility. I admire you for bringing this entire group together. Hopefully many good things will come out of this in dealing our Islamophobia, our new homework of our society. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Carl Goodman. I'm the articles editor for the forum. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing our next panel. Um, would the panelists please uh, come on down? Um, this panel will deal with percep perceptions of Muslims and Islam in the media and the government. Uh, professor Cashin is a full professor of law at Georgetown University. She received her bachelor's degree from Vanderbilt and her master's of law from Oxford University. She received her JD from Harvard Law School, where she was a member of the Harvard Law Review. After law school, she clerked for Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall. Uh, Professor Cashin's article considers discrimination against Muslims from a social science perspective. She explores society's willingness to trade personal liberties for national security and advocates strengthening local programs that promote inclusive multiculturalism. multiculturalism. And she may have to leave slightly early, so don't be, don't be alarmed. <laughs> Um, professor Huck is an assistant professor of law at the University of Chicago Law School. He earned his bachelor's from UNC Chapel Hill, his law degree from Columbia Law School, and he clerked for Justice Ginsburg on the Supreme Court. Uh, professor Huck's article compares different views of radicalization, which is the process through which religious fervor allegedly transforms into terroristic tendencies um, and compares differing, differing approaches to radicalization in the United States and the United Kingdom. Uh, professor Yin is a professor of law at the Lewis and Clark Law School. He received his BS from uh, California Institute of Technology and his MJ and JD from UC Berkeley. And he clerked on both the Ninth and Tenth Circuits. Uh, professor Yin's essay tracks changes in the portrayals of Muslims and Arabs in American TV and film. Um, and he analyzes how their portrayal in pop culture affects Americans' perceptions and opinions of Muslims and Arabs in the real world. Um, finally, Professor Vidmar is our moderator today. Um, he's the Russell M. Robinson Professor of Law at Duke University. Uh, he's a very strong ally of the forum and personifies our inter interdisciplinary approach. Um, instead of a law degree, he earned his MA and PhD in social psychology from the University of Illinois, Urbana, uh, and then joined the faculty of the Department of Psychology at the University of Western Ontario in Canada. Um, he joined the Duke Law faculty in 1989 with a cross appointment in the Department of Psychology at Duke. And he's worked as an expert on the pretrial publicity in, ca in the cases of John Walker Lind and Sami Al Aryan, and uh, a Muslim student on trial in New Zealand. Um, thank you. You didn't discuss this. Do you have a preference about going first? Um. I hate to say it, but I do have a preference, mainly because I have a plan. Fine, go for it. <laughs> and um, thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here. I want to thank the, the Duke Law, the, the Duke Forum for Law and Social Change for, for um, having this conference, focusing on this particular topic. I also want to give shouts out to Stephanie and Lauren for making my trip um, really smooth. And again, I apologize to my co-panelists and other speakers today. I really regret that I, we have a snowstorm in Washington, D.C., and I have to leave by 10.30, so I'll be quick. How, how much time are we each allotted? About 10 minutes? I, about 10 minutes, okay. 10 to 12 minutes, um, yeah. Well, um, 
this very brief essay actually is a little bit different from the, the, the abstract in the program. It changed as I wrote it. But what I essentially do with this paper, I, I write about race relations um, heavily about how black, black folks are treated in this country. Um, and uh, I, I was intrigued uh, by this invitation because I was just knew very, very little about the Muslim experience of discrimination. Um, and I knew a little bit about implicit bias research, and it struck me that both of these groups, um, along with others, in implicit bias tests, and if, if for those of you who are not familiar with them, you can go to a website at Harvard, just put in implicit bias, and you can take a test which uh, attempts to um, uh, measure your subconscious attitudes about other groups. And I begin the essay with a confession that I, a pro-integration scholar who writes about race relations, registered a slight preference for Europeans over blacks, go figure, and a slight preference for um, um, non-Muslims over Muslims. I'm not proud of that fact. But what was fascinating to me in looking at all the research about both explicit, implicit, subconscious, and reported or explicit bias is that um, uh, most people in the state, in the United States, profess a non-racist, um, um, non-discriminatory um, attitude, and it is considered un-American uh, now to be racist or to be discriminatory, and people's reported biases against African Americans have gone way down. Um, meanwhile, um, you know, our imp implicit biases against African Americans are, are, are still quite high, but since 9-11, um, with each passing year, reported or explicit biases about Muslims or people perceived as Muslims have been going up, as, as the imam uh, testified uh, you know, to. Um, and it's pa it was painful for me to hear about that, um, about how um, um, kids, uh, young um, um, Islamic or Muslim kids feel. Um, so I wanted to explore this, uh, you know, uh, comparative treatment, um, you know, uh, uh, and if you look at and, and why that is, um, and try, trying to compare um, very briefly the experience of discrimination of African Americans to that of Muslims, um, you know, what might we learn from that? Well, you know, the uh, uh, historically and continuing today, African Americans are, are typically at the bottom of the racial hierarchy in this country. And to the extent that we have evidence of some expanded capacity, at least in our explicit consciousness, uh, to embrace African Americans as Americans, that says something about our capacity as a nation to embrace others. Uh, and I wanted to explore that. Um, so I begin the paper and just uh, uh, underscore the fact of, of um, a very different experience for African Americans versus Muslims or people perceived as such, um, Muslim Americans as well, in terms of explicit or reported bias. And then I begin to delve into why that is. Um, and you know, the simplistic answer is 9-11, 9-11, 9-11, the simplistic answer. Um, since those attacks, um, I, I, arguably those attacks and the media about them um, created a quote unquote terrorist stereotype that fuels a perception in the American psyche of Islam and the Middle East as being a civilization in polar opposition to that of the United States and the West. And, um, and this oppositional terrorist stereotypes continues, as the Imam mentioned, to be propagated intentionally and unintentionally through a variety of media outlets. And I, I identify some of the main forces, but there is, make no mistake about it, there is, I call it hyperventilated Islamophobia. There is an Islamophobic movement in this country. And fortunately, you know, media is very atomized and depending on your ideological or, you know, whatever um, um, uh, predilections, where you get your information can be very, very atomized. But there's a growing cadre of um, anti-Islamic, anti-Muslim activist writers and pundits who tend to equate Islam with terrorist violence and they raise the specter of Muslims in the United States, including American citizens, comprising a fifth column intent on aiding anti-American terrorist groups abroad. 
And some of the people who do this, you know, names that might be familiar to you, David Horowitz, Robert Spencer, Daniel Pipes, Glenn Beck, Bill O'Reilly, Michelle Malkin, there's this ugly stuff said um, intentionally to, pro to promote this stereotype. Please um, um, keep me apprised of my time. Um, you gave me like a two minute oh. word. Okay. Um, and then um, mainstream journalism, I think more unintentionally than intentionally, ten regularly propagates this cultural stereotype about Muslims, often giving airtime to extremist Muslims um, and just reporting about um, terrorist events. Um, if I had more time, I could give you examples of things that will, you'll read in the New York Times that uncritically propagate a stereotype. Um, um, and there's much research from empirical psychology, which I, I cite, um, that strongly suggests that anti-Muslim media coverage contributes to prejudice against Muslims. You can find you know, these uh, psychology surveys where if you prime a person with an anti-Muslim story, not surprisingly, um, those kinds of views um, 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 affect their subconscious and conscious attitudes about Muslims or people perceived as such. Um, now, in the next part of the paper, I, I contrast the experience of African Americans. And I, I'm not going to sugarcoat this and suggest that everything is wonderful. Um, um, uh, there's still, uh, you know, the, the group that experiences the highest number of hate crimes every year is African Americans. You know, we're still a historically and currently discriminated against group. But it is fascinating that, um, uh, you know, 82% of Americans in polls report that they have a favorable view, view of Americans, right? Um, and, and, kind of, uh, and only 43% say that about Muslims. So it's, it, it is fascinating that um, uh, in our reported conscious, people treat African Americans very differently or think about African Americans very differently. First of all, typically we're thought of as American. You know, we maybe thought, thought about a lot of different ways. You know, even, even a ghetto brother is thought about in negative stereotypes, but nobody dis disputes that, that that brother is an American, you know. Um, and I talk about why it is uh, that African Americans have this different experience. Well, one is demographics, you know, familiarity breeds uh, more tolerance, and sh surveys show this. If you actually know a Muslim, and know something about Islam, you tend to have a more favorable view. And demographically, in the United States, you're just more likely to know a black person than a Muslim. But also, in the media, you can find countless examples of, you know, despite some negative disturbance, you can find countless examples of African Americans who are popular and well-liked. Um, I had this line in my paper, I'm going to have to change it now, from Obama to Oprah, Will Smith to Tiger Woods. <laughs> I think I might have to change that. <laughs> this I turned it in in November, you know. <laughs> um, but there are abundant examples of African Americans who exemplify our most cherished chivalrous about America is the land of opportunity. Meanwhile, I, I'm ashamed to say I can't give you a similar example of a, of a popular Muslim American. Um, meanwhile, the actions of, you know, the bad actions of, some, of, 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 you know, bad Muslim actors receive considerable media attention, as, you know, the Fort Hood shootings attest. And then I also talk about there's this unique process. How much time do I have left? Yeah, you've still got five, six minutes. Okay. Yeah. There's this unique process, another phenomenon is, there's a unique process of differentiation that 9-11 brought about. And, and um, again, uh, cognitive research bears this out. One researcher demonstrated, for example, that when events or situations are threatening to our sense of individual or group security, the result can be a stronger sense of in-group loyalty. Everybody was displaying American flags after 9-11. And, and, and when your in-group loyalties are primed, that tends to, to heighten your sense of who's outside of that group. Um, and in the social science research, in the wake of 9-11, those who most strongly self-identified as American, uh, were that was the most effective predictor of anti-Arab sentiment. And you have these ongoing, with each terrorist incident, be it abroad or, or here, um, those kinds of processes of differentiation become heightened. Um, and the other contrast, and I think this is, 
you know, the most important point about the differential experience of, of discrimination. You know, since the first black slave landed in America in 1619 in Jamestown, there's been this process of struggle and resistance, a near 400 year process of struggle and resistance, a process on the part of Africans of becoming American. Um, and it mirrors this, uh, you know, this struggle is mirrored with most other historically racially supported ethnic groups. All these groups have been on this journey of struggle and resistance to the idea that um, only white is American. And there's a sense in which it feels like that process is just beginning um, for Muslims. And I talk about how, you know, within one generation, we went from a country where the majority of whites professed um, an anti-black feeling, you know, supported the idea of separate but equal to one in which that ideology was rejected. What, how were we able to do that? How were we able to alter a nation's explicit consciousness? The modern civil rights move, movement did that. And it's easy with the passage of time to forget how labor intensive that process was. You know, when the children of Birmingham went into jails, and, and, and um, uh, the nation saw hoses turned on them and dogs turned on them, um, a seemingly spontaneous chorus of thousands of protests in nearly 100 cities happened, but that didn't happen by accident. Um, it, that took years of planning by the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, um, uh, years of grassroots work to create a, a, a groundswell of demand um, um, uh, uh, to the political elites to desegregate and, and pass anti-discrimination laws. And I argue in, in conclusion, you know, moving toward my conclusion, that I think it would take the same degree of intentionality, of grassroots mobilization, for us to create an, a, a, a cultural ethos in which Muslim, to be Muslim, or is, 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 you know, Muslims are welcomed into the American family. And I wish I could be optimistic that that was likely to happen. But where is the impetus for that kind of mobilization? It's not there. And unfortunately, events like the Fort Hood um, incident, and the, you know, the, I call him the crotch bomber. He's British, but you know, Nigerian. But um, these events don't um, um, create, you know, help to create much of a context for this kind of of, of mobilization. Well, I argue um, in the final couple pages of my paper that I think there are a lot of lessons to be learned, not just from the modern civil rights movement, but, but for, from the grassroots organizations that are doing the best work in um, building multiracial coalitions in America today. And, and I, I um, have written about them before, the Gamaliel Foundation, G-A-M-A-L-I-E-L -E and the Industrial Areas Foundation. There are organizations on the ground, mostly faith-based coalitions, that are fighting the good fight and building coalitions to, 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 to transcend race, to get saner public policies like fair share affordable housing. And I go to these conferences, as I go to these meetings, I'm on boards of civil rights organizations. I never see um, the interests of Muslims there. I never see Muslim people there. Um, the, the religious intolerance and the treatment of Muslims is just not part of traditional civil rights discourse in this country. It's just not. And I argue that, uh, to conclude, that we would gain a lot from Muslim civil rights and advocacy organizations reaching out to become a part of these coalitions and traditional civil rights organizations intentionally reaching out to these groups to add religious tolerance to the civil rights agenda in a very explicit way. Uh, Muslims comprise nearly one quarter of the world population. And until Americans, or you know, I shouldn't, I don't even, that's offensive in itself. Until people who live in the United States, because you know a lot of Muslims are Americans, um, uh, uh, begin to learn how to relate to this group. And, and, and my bottom line with all my work about race relations is that all groups need to be stretched. They need to be stretched to develop the capacity, I call it cultural dexterity, to relate to the other. Until we learn to do that, 
we are not going to succeed um, with our, our, our ultimate project of, of, of building an America that lives up to our professed ideals. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> I'll go next. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the staff of the uh, Duke Forum for Law and Social Change for the invitation and for indulging my topic, and to the uh, staff for watching uh, countless mayhem in the TV shows and movies that I cited in my paper. <laughs> uh, I had to fly something like seven or eight hours in transit from Portland, Oregon, but I'm glad to see you made me feel welcome at home with all this <laughs> rain. Uh, my project follows Professor Cashins in a very, I guess, neat way, as it turns out, because while she was focusing a bit on media depictions of uh, real life incidents, mine looks at depictions in popular culture, um, which I think is also relevant because, for one thing, uh, Americans probably watch more fictional TV and movies than they actually read newspapers and get news. So to the extent that uh, Arabs, Arab Americans, and Muslims are depicted in TV shows and movies, that also, I think, shapes the perceptions that Professor Cashin is talking about. Um, so what I did is I looked at uh, various blockbuster movies and TV shows, both in the pre-9-11 setting and the post-9-11 setting, to get a sense of what, if anything, has changed in the depictions. And at the outset, I should say that um, uh, I realized that actually a majority of Muslims in the world are not Arabs. Um, but the focus in these TV shows and movies invariably equates Muslim with Arab. So I'm aware of the distinction, but by, nece uh, by necessity, the topics that I've looked at tend to conflate the two in contemporary media. Um, so additional reasons that I think that pop culture matters, and it, uh, not just that people see this, uh, what Hollywood produces is often a reflection of the uh, anxiety and perceptions of the times. Uh, and, and many people who defend the depiction of uh, Arab terrorists in movies say, but look, this is what we see is Arab terrorists. And, uh, and people accept this in a way that they wouldn't necessarily accept with other racial groups or religious groups. We don't really see movies today with, let's say, African American terrorists as the group, um, simply perhaps because society would look at that and think that doesn't seem, that seems maybe mildly offensive. And so Hollywood recognizes that one group can be uh, depicted as the enemy and other groups perhaps not. That's a reflection of what audiences are willing to accept. Uh, there's also been a lot of writings about what impact pop culture has in real life, uh, ranging from the positive. There was this old 70s TV show called Emergency, where uh, it was about these two paramedics, and they would get their daily calls to go out and save people and so on. And one study found that after this show came out and was quite popular, more and more communities demanded, well, we should have that kind of emergency service. So TV can be good in that way. Um, it can also be good with what's called the CSI effect, that apparently criminal uh, trials are now finding that juries expect and demand forensic evidence of the CSI variety, even when it can't necessarily be shown. So some criminal defendants are getting acquitted because the juries are saying, Where, where's Gil Grissom? <laughs> Uh, on the other hand, the impact can be negative, in, and as has been widely reported, um, the uh, Brigadier General who's in charge of West Point actually flew to Hollywood, met with the producer, producers of 24, and said, can you stop having so much torture, or at least showing it not work, because we're actually seeing American troops in Iraq who are, they're not trained interrogators, and so their idea of interrogating is to do what Jack Bauer does. Um, and of course, it works on TV, but less so in real life. Um, so there's a lot of evidence out there that suggests that what is depicted in Hollywood actually does influence how people think. Um, OK, so now, the movies and TV shows that I looked at, I won't give you copious descriptions of them, but um, I looked at the pre-9-11 setting. There are movies like Navy SEALs, True Lies, Executive Decision, and The Siege. And all of these movies depict um, Arab terrorists. Now, sometimes they're identified specifically as being Palestinians or Leban Lebanese. Other times, they're just generically Arab. Uh, they pick sort of <laughs> actors who look sort of Arab, even though they actually aren't. Uh, and we know that they're Arabs and Muslims because as they're committing all their mayhem, they start shouting uh, 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 Allah, uh, Allah, uh, Allah uh, Akbar, and so forth. So uh, it's just this kind of vague notion of, of the enemy. Uh, they involve weapons of mass destruction, either biological chemical weapons, uh, nuclear weapons. 
there's virtually no motivation explained for why they want to do their terrible deeds other than just to kill lots of people. Uh, and so uh, it's a very sort of very flat, cartoonish depiction of them. Um, now, in the post-9-11 setting, how have things changed? Uh, things have changed somewhat in that um, uh, there's more of an emphasis on including at least one person in the, on the, quote, good guy side who is depicted as also being uh, of Arab descent or Muslim, um, which is very rare in the pre-9-11 setting. The only movie that had uh, an Arab character who was a, quote, good guy was The Siege. Um, so in, in one sense, there's, I guess, more of a recognition that Arabs and Muslims actually play a counterterrorism role. But on the other hand, they're sort of uh, tokenized often in the sense of that the main impetus of the action is still the sort of traditional Caucasian non-Muslim character. Uh, and so, um, so in that sense, the, the changes have been incremental but not very significant. Um, we still see a lot of uh, Arab terrorists a lot of weapons of mass destruction and so forth. And there's a new development that was fairly uncommon in the old movies, which is the, quote, sleeper cell, which is now the terrorism we have to worry about is not just from overseas. Now we have to worry about seemingly normal Americans who live next door who are actually secretly plotting our destruction <laughs> and, uh, and mayhem. So in some sense, that's a, a step backwards in terms of, uh, of the uh, of the depiction uh, in the TV shows and movies. So from looking at these shows, I drew three conclusions. The first one is that uh, even though 9-11 led to predictably a greater increase in, um, in uh, Middle Eastern themed terrorism shows, it did not lead to an increase in actual uh, Arab actor, uh, I should say, uh, actors of Arab descent working in these roles which I find, found kind of interesting, because you would think that if we're actually having more shows that are depicting Arab terrorists, you would think that that would translate at least perhaps into to greater um, uh, screen time. But instead, if you look at the actual uh, ethnicities of various actors who are put in these, these roles, the thing that I found was that the uh, group that benefited the most turned out to be um, Indian, not Native American, but Asian Indian actors. Uh, <laughs> So then there are, uh, <laughs> yes, um, then Latinos also benefit from this. Uh, there are Latinos who are cast as, as uh, Middle Eastern characters. Uh, there are Greek act, Greek American actors who are cast as, as, uh, as Arab actors. Um, and then depending on whether you consider Iran, uh, Middle East, I suppose one could argue that uh, there are Iranian American actors who are cast in these, and of course certainly some Pakistani uh, American actors, um, and Pakistan is a, a predominantly Muslim country, but not, not Arab. And to the extent that these shows are focusing on the characters as Arab, there's a bit of a mismatch there. Uh, so you, one explanation for this might be that, um, that uh, there just aren't enough Arab American actors. Um, but that's probably not really likely to be the case. Um, I mean, there's Tony Shalhoub, who was in Wings for many years, and more recently was uh, Mr. Monk, the uh, very compulsive, obsessive detective in the show, uh, who's a prominent Lebanese-American actor. Um, there's uh, Wentworth Miller, who was on prison break, is of partial uh, Arab descent. Um, of course, there are other actors, Michael Nori, uh, Jamie Farr and MASH, probably a little bit old to play a terrorist these days, but um, certainly the, the idea is that there are, there are um, actors of Arab descent available. So some of them, like Mr. Shahoub, has said that he refuses to play terrorists, uh, and that might explain, in, in some sense, his uh, refusal to play the roles. But there are other actors who probably would be willing to get the screen time to make their names. So another explanation might be that they're just not, quote, good enough. Hollywood is a very subjective industry. Um, and, uh, but I think if you look at these TV shows um, and movies, it, it's not like these are necessarily up for Academy Awards, where acting <laughs> is, is uh, Meryl Streep is not going to be playing these roles. So um, the other explanation is, I found, um, maybe in a weird sort of analogy, like constructive discharge in employment law, which is to say that um, if an employer wants to fire somebody, in a protected class, but they're concerned that if they fire them, they'll get hit with a discrimination suit. Uh, a 
an employer might think, what if we just make them quit? And so they just keep making the conditions of work so intolerable for the employee that the employee then quits. And then when the employee files the lawsuit, the employer says, we didn't fire you. You quit on your own. We can't be sued. Well, the courts put an end to that by saying, no, no, there's a doctrine called constructive discharge. If you make it so intolerable for them that they quit, it's the same as if you fired them. So uh, I'm not saying that exactly applies here, because I don't think this is intentional. But I think the net effect of the roles is that they're so relatively unpalatable that it explains why people like Tony Shell who wouldn't want to play them. Uh, so this is, a, again, somewhat subjective. But if you watch 24, as I uh, obsessively do, <laughs> you notice that in the, uh, I noticed for the first six seasons, there was this pattern that in the odd numbered seasons, the bad guys were typically uh, Eastern European. <laughs> And in the even-numbered seasons, the bad guys were portrayed as Arabs. So we have an interesting comparison of, of bad guys. And the Arab terrorists in the show are, they're, they're lethally competent. There's no doubt about that. Um, it's not like they never succeed in killing anybody. They kill lots of people. That's part of what 24 is about. But they're somewhat robotic. Um, they really could be played like Arnold Schwarzenegger in The Terminator, where they have no emotions. They just carry out their missions. Uh, whereas if you look at the actors who've played the bad guys in the odd-numbered seasons, you have Dennis Hopper, who, if there's anything you know about Dennis Hopper, he's a scene chewer. He just cackles with delight. Uh, in season three, in the beginning, there are a couple of Mexican drug lords who are the bad guys. Again, you know, we have stereotypes here, but we have Joaquim uh, Almeida, who, uh, if you saw the Tom Clancy uh, movie, Clear and Present Danger with Harrison Ford, he played the, uh, the quote, Latin Jack Ryan in the movie. Um, he's, so he's a well-known actor. He played one of the drug lords. And he, just from watching it, you can tell he had so much more fun than anybody else in taunting Jack Bauer throughout all the scenes they were together. So the roles are written somewhat differently, where the, the non-Arab roles give more, uh, I mean, they're still cartoonish. But they have, the actors seem to have more fun with the, uh, the roles than the Arab roles do. So that, in some ways, may explain why. Uh, why actors of Arab descent are not interested in these, and hence there's the need to go to various other um, ethnic groups. So, so that was the first conclusion, that, uh, that we simply don't see a large number of, uh, of Arab actors, which suggests maybe there's something wrong with these depictions. Uh, the second conclusion I drew was looking at the flip side. Forget about the bad guys. What about the good guys? As I mentioned, there's this, there is an increase in having um, Arab characters on the counterterrorism side. But I also said that they tended to be uh, not marginalized, but somewhat tokenized. Um, and in comparison to real life, if you look at real life, uh, one thing that we know is that there's a, a former FBI agent named Ali Soufan, who's, uh, who grew up or was born in Lebanon, but grew up in the United States, speaks Arabic perfectly. And he played one of the key roles in interrogating the early al-Qaeda uh, masterminds that we caught. Uh, Abu Zubaydah, who was one of the ones who was waterboarded, um, I think, 80-some times. Before the CIA took custody of, of Zubaydah, of uh, Abu Zubaydah, Ali Soufan was one of the ones interrogating him, not through waterboarding, not through coercive interrogations, but through traditional law enforcement interrogations. The key difference is that Soufan, being fluent in Arabic, <laughs> was able to develop the sort of rapport with him and actually was getting uh, somewhat useful information from Z uh, Abu Zubaydah. Only uh, then did the CIA come in, take over, and begin coercive interrogation, at which point Abu Zubaydah stopped talking, and then they uh, moved on to the, the uh, abusive and coercive interrogation methods. Um, Ali Sufan also got the confession from, uh, from Mr. Hamdan, who was recently uh, was the subject of the Supreme Court case. He was allegedly Osama bin Laden's driver and bodyguard. And again, Sufan was the one who interrogated him, again, through traditional law enforcement methods. So what we see is that in real life, there are no Jack Bowers. But if there's anybody who's played kind of a Jack Bauer-like role without the torture and stuff, but actually in terms of uh, getting information about plots, it was, uh, it was an FBI agent of Arab descent who, because of his cultural background and his language abilities, was able to develop this sort of rapport. The TV shows and movies don't depict this sort of key role that, uh, that Arab American agents have played. And I think one of the consequences of that is that these shows downplay the problem that the FBI has, which is that on September 11, 2001, the entire FBI had eight agents who were fluent in Arabic. 
and just eight. Now, you might think, okay, 2001, 9-11 was a surprise. But in 2006, five years later, when you think there would be a crash course in maybe we should develop agents who can, are fluent in Arabic, the number was still only 33 out of the entire uh, FBI force. And this is after the FBI massively retooled its mission to a counterterrorism profile. Uh, and so why? Why is it the FBI has such trouble developing uh, agents who are Arabic speakers? And the answer is that the best way to become fluent in a foreign language is to go live in, that, in countries that speak that foreign language where you're immersed in it. The problem, and there are many Americans who actually have spent much time in the Middle East um, and other countries where Arabic is the primary language. The problem is that when you spend that much time, our government now considers you to be a security risk. Uh, and therefore, you will not get security clearance. So there's a bit of a chicken and egg situation. And I think that, that the, the, the TV shows sort of downplay this problem and instead suggest that all we need are, uh, is Jack Bauer augmented by technology, satellites, uh, wiretaps on phones, and so forth. Of course, in 24, um, we have the bad guys who, um, who are, again, depicted as, as uh, Arab, speaking in overheard conversations in English. So of course, there's no need to get a translator, because they're just very foolishly telling us their devious plots uh, in a language we can understand, which I think <laughs> is, is pretty silly. Um, so the, uh, the final conclusion that I have is looking at these, the, this phenomenon of sleeper cells that appear in these recent shows, again, where the idea of depicting uh, seemingly normal Americans uh, as, in fact, uh, agents of chaos and destruction. Um, and the problem with the depiction here is, again, if you compare it to real life, we have had uh, probably over 100, uh, several hundred Americans who have been prosecuted since 9-11 for terrorism-related offenses. Uh, but when I say terrorism-related, one should probably think at this point, you've already gotten trained enough in law school to think about, ah, but what does terrorism-related mean? Is it terrorism or is it related to terrorism? Terrorism-related, the way that our government tracks it, includes uh, such crimes as providing material support to designated foreign terrorist organizations. So uh, if you write a check to um, an organization that happens to be on the State Department's list of designated terrorist organizations, that's providing material support. If you go and uh, provide yourself to one of these organizations, that's providing material support according to the definition of the courts. So um, this exaggerates what we're talking about because in the shows, these people are not writing checks and they're not just going out and, and firing firearms in the shooting range. They're actually devising plans with weapons of mass destruction and so forth. Whereas the, uh, the most of the people who've been caught in these, uh, these investigations are nowhere near that kind of level of lethality. I mean, they're somewhat, I don't want to say clowns, but the plots they have are, are so vague and uh, not to say they're not dangerous and they don't have bad intent, but uh, there was a, a, pizza, um, a pizza driver in Fort Dix who with a couple of guys, their plan was to get some automatic rifles and shoot at the nearby military base. Uh, which is quite a bit different from let's put a nuclear weapon into some major city. So, uh, so these shows depict these sleeper cells. They exaggerate the danger posed by homegrown terrorists. And the problem with this is that, uh, of course, if you see enough of this, it makes uh, the idea of profi racial profiling become more acceptable. It, uh, again, exaggerates and, and inflames the anti-Arab and anti-Muslim biases that uh, Professor Cashin has, has brought up. And we see this in... Um, in some of the, uh, the policies that the government has instituted. There's one program that I talk about in the paper called iWatch, where the government says, you should just be alert and report strange things to the government, which uh, on the, in the abstract is probably a good idea. But on the other hand, if what we're all sort of uh, ingrained into thinking is, is odd and unusual, is, uh, is speaking, just making Arabic prayers, then predictably our focus in these programs is going to be on Arabs and, uh, and Muslims. Uh, and so uh, again, I think that this depiction uh, creates uh, a problem of, uh, of having us focus only, uh, all of our attention only in one area, which would happen to be Arabs and Muslims. So I'll mm -hmm. stop here and thank you for thank you. indulging me. <laughs>
So thank you very much to, uh, to Matt, to Carl, and the other editors of the journal for the hard work they've put into both the symposium and the issue. And thank you very much to both uh, Professor Cashin and to uh, Professor Yin for their uh, engaging and stimulating uh, papers. I, I have one piece of corroborating evidence that, that I, as a, as a South Asian, was actually approached to be Jack Bauer's punching bag. It was just my, <laughs> my career choice. Let's go to the law teaching. I'll do this. I was a second. I was. The, their, their second choice after Meryl Street. Um, but they decided I, I did, just didn't look lethally competent oh. enough. So um, I, I can corroborate. Um, charting the, and, and understanding the social dynamics of discrimination, what, what's called in this symposium, the new face of discrimination, um, and the capacity of legal instruments to respond to it, um, presents formidable doctrinal and empirical challenges. Um, challenges that are only compounded by the fluid and rapidly evolving social and political context of Muslim America. Um, the iterative security shocks from 9-11 through to the Christmas Day attempt on a Detroit-bound flight are merely the most obvious disruptions of context that make a study of this form of discrimination difficult. Um, and as I hope the diversity of papers in this symposium demonstrate, um, this new face of discrimination is amenable to a whole series of different analytic tools. Professor Cashin, for example, uh, turns to social science research. Professor Yin looks at uh, popular culture and employs a form of cultural critique. Uh, my paper aims to broaden the toolkit that one can use to understand and think about discrimination in this, in this context. Um, and it, it, it approaches the, the topic of discrimination indirectly by looking at the way in which the state in both the United States and the United Kingdom conceptualize the problem of terrorist radicalization. Um, and so in the, in the excessively academic language of the paper, uh, what I'm interested in is the state's epistemology of terrorist violence and its corresponding influence upon how resources are allocated and policy outcomes determined in the national security domain. Um, and, and if the paper makes a contribution, it's really to identify this as a subject of academic inquiry. It's a subject that warrants careful attention. Now, when I, when I broached this topic to Carl uh, and the other editors, they were understandably reluctant. What they wanted to know does this have to do directly with discrimination? And, and to their credit, they were very willing to listen to my arguments that this, was, this is a, 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 a subject that pertains to the, the general topic of the symposium. Um, to see if I can identify the linkage in, in a reasonably blunt way, um, historians have excavated the Jim Crow uh, laws that dominated the United States and for the, uh, up through the end of the first half of the century. Um, they've excavated the, the intellectual and ideological basis of those laws as a way of understanding how ideas about race enter into legal forms. Um, what the law thinks, so to speak, matters greatly to what the law does. Um, and so what, what I do in the paper is to look at two emerging sets of policies, uh, one in the United States and one in the United Kingdom. And, and these policies are about uh, what I call in the paper radicalization. Uh, and, and this can be defined as the social, psychological, and ideological processes whereby one moves from nonviolent political action to a commitment to violence. Now, and just to dissent a little bit from Carl's, or to, or to friendly amend Carl's description, I, I'm not writing in this paper, I'm not interested here in actually describing why it is that somebody decides to resort to violence. Right? That, that's an interesting topic. It's the subject of a lot of social science research, but it's not what I'm interested in here. What I'm interested <coughs> in is, why does the state believe that somebody turns to violence? How does the state think about radicalization? Now, and, I, and I'm very aware that it's often a suspect anthropomorphism to talk about what it is that the state thinks or what it is that the state believes. The state is an abstraction. 
Um, but I think in this case, the, 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 um, the device or, 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 the, or this way of talking is plausible because we have uh, documents from both the American and the British context that outline how different state agencies conceptualize the process of radicalization. There are, incidentally, other countries that, that have engaged in similar exercises, the Nordic countries, and, the, and actually the Netherlands has a very interesting set of, of, of papers and, and policy statements about this. Um, and, and what I hope to persuade you is that even without having a baseline view about what the social science tells us about the process of, of radicalization in the world, we can nonetheless say something quite meaningful about what states are doing uh, or, or how states understand radicalization and how that affects their policy choices. Um, so rather than going through the, the relatively dry uh, factual exposition that, that the paper um, uh, does, that, that's code for the paper's really boring and you really ought not to read it, um, let me focus upon the US context, because it's obviously the one that, that's of most interest here. Um, and, and let me talk you through a little bit of the what, does, what, what uh, radicalization means to the state in the United States, and a little bit about what, what inferences we can draw from that, uh, uh, both about the, the policies that emerge and about the political economy that generates this set of understandings. Um, so the, the, the story of, of, of radicalization as a subject of public policy in the United States is, um, is of interest, even at the threshold, because it bucks the traditional story of the allocation of national security power between the federal and the state government. In the standard narrative, national security is the responsibility of the federal government. Um, it's a public good, and we'd expect it to be underproduced if we left it to the individual states, right? It's, that's Cod Law 101. Um, in the, with respect to radicalization policy, however, the most important initiatives have emerged at the state and local level, uh, specifically in New York City and in Pennsylvania. Um, state and local police forces have on their own initiative generated documents that purport to describe the process of radicalization. By contrast, the federal government has hung back um, testimony from uh, senior officials under the Bush administration uh, suggests that both the FBI and the DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, have been cautious and tentative in articulating a model of terrorist radicalization. Um, and indeed, to the extent that any federal official has gravitated toward a particular model, um, it's, it's been a... a a senator, uh, Joe Liebman, who's the chair of the, the Senate Homeland Security Committee. And Senator Liebman has gravitated toward the New York model, or the model set forth by the NYPD. Um, we actually see the same dynamic with respect to uh, a set of investigative tactics developed by the LAPD, where uh, a model for investigating terrorism, something called special activity reports, that the LAPD generated has been picked up on the federal level, right? So the traditional narrative of, of, the, of the division of powers between state and federal authorities doesn't play out in, in this context. Both the NYPD and the Pennsylvania document pick documents pick out uh, terrorism explicitly or notionally linked to Islam or indicia of, uh, of belief in Islam. Uh, as their subject. So the, the NYPD report, for example, sets out a four-stage process of radicalization. So, for example, it identifies a group of people who are, quote-unquote, pre-radicalization. And, and it identifies the following signatures of being pre-radicalization. Becoming alienated from one's former life. Uh, giving up cigarettes, drinking, gambling, and urban hip-hop gangster clothes wearing traditional Islamic clothing, growing a beard, becoming involved in social activism and community issues. Whoops, there goes social mobilization. <laughs> um, <coughs> it goes on to articulate three more phases. Uh, that in, the, in the final, uh, what it calls the jihadiza jihadization uh, phase, uh, this is characterized, among other things, by undertaking outward bound activities. Uh, and in one striking passage, uh, it's characterized by the ownership of wilted plants, which may be a sign that noxious explosives are being prepared at a location. Um, I, 
you know, I, I obviously am picking out these examples to, to make a point, um, but the, um, the NYPD report and the Pennsylvania uh, State Police document raise a number of concerns in their methodology. And, 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 and one can talk about these concerns without having a view of what the underlying process is. So let me pick out three. Um, in, in these documents about radicalization, there tends to be a selection bias problem, right? So the reports will take Islamic-related terrorism as their subject, and then they will draw a set of conclusions about terrorism, whereby they identify, for example, um, uh, Muslim social activism or indicia of Muslim dress as a, as a signature of risk, right? So this is, this is circular. You, you can't pick a sample to study by defining the sample in terms of a characteristic and say that the, that the presence of the characteristic demonstrates anything about the sample, right? Um, the, the second problem is that the, the, many of the signatures, to use the phrase that the NYPD uses, uh, identified in these reports are pervasive in the ambient population, that the signatures of terrorist risk are broadly shared in the ambient, uh, in, in the general population. What, in, in effect, this does, if, if taken seriously, is to loosen constraints on investigative discretion. If almost everyone is a suspect or a possible suspect, allocations of investigative resources can be distorted by many factors, including the presence of ambient invidious discrimination or amb ambient, ambient invidious motive. Um, third, the, and, and sort of mo most difficult to see, the report mixes studies of completed terrorist conspiracies with incidents in which uh, an attack has been forestalled. Now, this raises a couple of problems. The first is that journalistic accounts of several of the attacks or purported planned attacks that are described cast doubt upon whether an actual terrorist attack was planned. Moreover, in, in other instances, uh, it become, it, it's clear through uh, journalistic evidence and through the trials in these cases that police informants and provocateurs play a catalytic role in movement toward a terrorist attack. So there's a troubling feedback loop going on in, in the background to these reports, with the police influencing the content and the direction of, of terrorism prosecutions, and then relying upon those terrorism prosecutions to characterize the underlying public policy problem. Right. Um, so part of the, 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 the purpose of the paper is to critique these models on their own terms. But another, another reason for, or another motivation for writing the paper was trying to understand, well, why are these policies emerging in the way that they are? Um, why are they, for example, bubbling up at the state level rather than where you would expect them to emerge, at the federal level, right? Um, so my, my estimation of what is going on here is, is a political economy story. Um, and, and it's best told around the, the NYPD report. Um, and, and what I argue in the paper is that the NYPD report is part of a larger move to establish that locality's police department as the premier counterterrorism agency in the United States. Um, the NYPD has long contested the FBI's uh, superiority with respect to national security in what one former FBI an analyst has described as a protracted and counterproductive bureaucratic struggle. Its radicalization analysis was a preemptive strike in the battle over which domestic security agency uh, has the, the greatest competence with respect to, to terrorism concern. And it's also a gamble for funding. In praising the, uh, the, the New York report, Senator Liebman, for example, emphasized that Congress must ensure adequate funding for local law enforcement on national security grounds. Expertise begets investment. Um, understanding the dynamics of the, of the production of knowledge about, um, about radicalization also means looking at the ability of the minority groups affected by these policies to mobilize with respect to them. This is picking up on a point that, that Professor Cashin made. Um, and, and in part, one of the reasons I draw out the, uh, the or I present both US and UK uh, material is to show or to, to suggest that there's a difference between uh, the way that policy has developed in the US and the way that policy has developed in the UK. Because in the UK, Muslims are a more significant, in per capita terms, minority group. 
who have larger representation at local and, st and national level governments and who are able to pressure police departments and security agencies into adopting different sets of uh, policies. So one needs to understand not just uh, inter-jurisdictional competition, one also needs to understand the interplay between social mobilization and government policy development, right? What constraints does social mobilization place upon the ability of a government to articulate certain policy positions? Um, and so what I, what I hope that one can take away from looking at these radicalization policies is, is that in thinking about discrimination, it isn't enough necessarily, although it may be an important start, to condemn a set of policies as discriminatory or, or, or non-discriminatory. It's important also to think about how particularly state policies emerge as a product of local political economies, of local social mobilizations, or when I say local, I mean characteristic of a, of a particular jurisdiction or set of jurisdiction. Um, and, and, and you know, all I can do in, in, a, in a symposium paper is to say, well, look, here are the, the, the basic dynamics of this model. Here are the basic uh, uh, vectors that may be pushing these policies to the fore. Um, but what I would hope is that, and, and like my colleagues, I think I see this as not a problem for today, but a, a characteristic of, of policymaking and, uh, and uh, American society for uh, decades to come. What I hope is that this kind of comparative and contextual political economy and legal analysis enables um, or, or provides a way of understanding the mechanics of the spread of the new face of discrimination. Thanks. I think this is the point in time we're supposed to uh, allow questions uh, to come to the fore. I, actually, I must say that I found uh, uh, an awful lot of all three of these, the, the presentations this morning very interesting and in relating even to some of my own work in, in uh, this area in, in varying ways. But I was surprised, uh, maybe I shouldn't be surprised, but uh, this weekend, this is the New York Times. And it's the jihadist next door. Boy, is he Arab looking. <laughs> uh, and it is an American who is in Somalia uh, who is doing it. And it, it raises a question in my mind, and, and, and I'm going to be provocative in raising this question, and maybe the, the panelists want to respond to it in some ways. It's not the process of becoming radicalized whether it was back in, in the 70s with the Black Panther movement, which was a movement, in fact, that's where I cut my teeth. The, the reason I got interested in law was I testified in a Black Panther murder trial in Toledo, Ohio. A uh, man accused of killing a policeman, and that, gee, this law stuff is really interesting, and that, that's what, what uh, really turned me around. But what they need is a hook, and that was black rights and, and uh, the feelings and so forth. The problem here, it seems to me, in separating these things is whatever the purpose of, ra I mean, whatever the process of radicalization that, that comes about, in this instance, it's done in the name of a religion. And I think that that is something that's very difficult. You know, it, it's unfair to, to, to Islam, but at least that group. And the real question is, how do you separate that out? And I think, Ziz, when you were talking about it, you know, obviously that is one marker. <laughs> Of, of if you're looking at the first discrimination, if you're trying to create some sort of a profile, which they're trying to worry about, it is something that they look at. And, and I know it's not right, but the question is, how do you separate that out? But I'll just leave those, those thoughts uh, and any questions that people have. Yes? Uh, I, I was really interested in the comparison of um, the black civil rights movement with what's going on now. And, and the fact that Professor Cashin uh, mentioned that you don't see um, the same type of uh, movement to hook religion to um, the civil rights movement. But I think that there's a, a big difference in that one of the things, the civil rights movement was really appealed to a moral cause. And so that what you have there is that they were saying, America, we are better than this. We can do better than this. Whereas the problem here is 
you have um, a, 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 a row of administrations, actually, that have attached uh, being patriotic and being America to fighting terrorism, that kind of buzz word, so that it, it's not like being the best as we can be uh, as Americans and not being discriminatory as it was with the uh, civil rights movement. But here, you can actually justify it on the basis of that it's us against them. And we're, uh, we're being patriotic and American uh, by doing this, by looking out for the terrorists terrorist next door. Well, you're, you're reinforcing one of my big points about the challenges of uh, trying to improve um, relations in this country and perceptions of Muslims. You know, in this environment, you know, I, I, I mean, the attacks um, against the West by terrorist groups are a reality and they're not going away. Um, and they're hijacking public perceptions of what it means to be a Muslim. Um, they're just completely hijacking it, you know, and so so many people who are just ignorant in general about Muslim, uh, Islam and what it stands for that that's you know that's their perception. And how do we counter that and build greater relations when that's the dynamic and it doesn't seem to be getting better? I, I like I said, I wish I could be optimistic, but I'm not. But I think those people, I mean, conferences like this, you know, they just need to happen over and over again. But in community, I mean, I, I, I suspect if I went and got the data and researched it, I suspect that um, um, uh, relations between Arabs and non-Arabs and Muslims and non-Muslims are probably better in Dearborn than other places. Why? Because they have such a large Arab American population. I'm, and I realize I'm conflating, but with familiarity comes tolerance, right? Um, um, so you just reinforce the challenges that I identify in my paper. Oh, yeah. Actually, can I just follow oh, up on sure, that? Oh, sure, sure. But I, I wonder, does the familiarity depend on whether it, the communities are segregated or non-segregated? Because um, in, I mean, I haven't lived in St. Louis, but I understand it's a fairly segregated city. And mm -hmm. I can see how that might actually lead to more inflamed racial tensions rather than less if you're living together, but you see it as that's their part of the community. And so I wonder if, it, I don't know Dearborn either. I mean, I know it has a large right. Arab American population, right, but. Right, right, right. Well, I, 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 I said this, and I want to be abs abundantly clear. I'm not, I do not want to paint a rosy picture about uh, black, non-black relations. I don't want to overstate, uh, you know, but the, my, my main observation, though, is, you know, we have a lot of work to do with anti-discrimination, but in a general sense, um, um, we've, 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 the country is a much better country than it used to be in terms of broad perceptions about whether discrimination is right or wrong, right? Um, but you're right. I mean, um, race relations in uh, St. Louis are, are pretty bad from what I, uh, from what I understand. And uh, the more uh, fragmented, segregated, a, a metropolitan region is, you know, um, you know, the more you have these tensions around equity and all, and all that. So, um, um, but my general point was that familiarity, the empirical research suggests that, you know, if you, if you know an Asian, you know, you're less likely to be anti-Asian. That's it. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Snow is over your head. Thank you. I have to leave in six minutes. <laughs> Okay. Uh, you had stated that the bias against uh, African Americans seems to be waning as it's increasing against uh, uh, explicit reported bias. Okay. You think as that opposed to subconscious. There's still a lot. You, you, you understand that most people won't go around saying the N word explicitly anymore. You think mm -hmm. that the African American decrease. In the, in the explicit uh, bias is the beneficiary of the increase yeah. in bias against <laughs> Arab Americans. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, interesting question. I think only in, the, in the, 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 the weeks and months immediately after 9 11. I mean, you know, I, I talked to 
there were some black men I had interesting conversations with where they, they felt like a little lifting, you know? <laughs> Somebody else is gonna be profiled. I'm gonna, you know, it, it was just brief, this sort of brief feeling like we're all, it's all us and then this group now, but I don't think, I, I, in, in any long-term sense, I don't think the phenomenon are related. No, I don't think they are. Uh, I'll, there's somebody way in the back there first, and then I'll turn here. Hey, um, I had a, just a question for Professor Yin. I, I found the, the media um, description very, very interesting. I was just wondering if you'd notice another explanation. I, I have a friend who played the main terrorist in the political satire, American Dreams, and, um, and that's a quasi-Iranian, quasi-Iraqi character. Um, he's 100% Iranian, born there, had a slight accent. <laughs> but on his first edition, they rejected him, saying, you're perfect, but you don't look like our stereotype. You're too light-skinned, even though he was you know, the main color of, <laughs> um, of people there. And so he had to actually go back wearing makeup. And that's how he got the role. <laughs> and throughout the movie, he's wearing a ton of makeup. And it, it looks ridiculous to me. But um, I was wondering if you've noticed that at all, maybe um, some of these other, uh, some of the people who are getting these roles may actually be darker skinned, and that might fit with Americans, maybe the more traditional prejudices of wanting to see the enemy as, as darker skinned, as distinguished from um, the majority in our country, for the, the dominant um, white. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I haven't gone back, and, I mean, I guess I'd have to go back and do some sort of color shading comparison, <laughs> but, um, but I suppose it reminds me of something I came across, which was a press release by um, by a, a Latino group that was actually um, uh, complaining about how the Latino actors used to get a lot of these roles, and now they were losing out on the roles to Indian Americans and, and others and so forth. So, um, you know, does that suggest that sort of preference? I suppose that it could be. I mean, your your example of your friend definitely would, would demonstrate that. Um, but uh, it, if you look at it, it's all people of color. It's just not people of Arab color who are getting these sorts of roles. Um, so I suppose that uh, it could well be what you're what you're identifying. We have a question back here, and I, I want to keep an eye because you want to break at nine thirty. Or 10.30, okay, let's take the um, question. Yeah, I have a question to Professor Hart. Um, uh, I'm watching a, a, a new trend in, in, in Europe, and uh, which is also a, a growing facet of Islamophobia there, and it, which is mostly expressed in kind of suppression, suppressing any uh, form of uh, social expression of Islamic identity. And I have two examples in mind. Uh, this, the ban on minarets in Switzerland. And recently, there's move also towards banning the, uh, the burqa for women uh, in, in France. And I'm wondering if this is done in the name of uh, uh, you know, uh, anti-terrorism or uh, towards, I mean, making us more secure. Um, I, I don't see how, how this is going to accomplish this goal. Uh, on the contrary, I think it's counterproductive. And suppression, people from expressing their uh, identity could actually be conducive to more radicalization. And just one comment to uh, Chair Cashin, please. Um, you mentioned David Pipes and how he has been very active, actually, in demonizing Muslims. And what I'm wondering is that because the main question is, what can we do to curb the trend and make people more protective of our, I mean, civil rights? And the question I, I'm wondering is, why we as Americans are not uh, are not doing more? Because, for example, David Pipes is is the architect of Campus Watch, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which actually polices academia. There are even incentives to students to report on professors who have expressed dissent uh, against the uh, war in Iraq. And, uh, and I'm, I'm just wondering, because we should not, people are silent if David Pipes demonizes Muslims. But these are, this is touching our rights, everybody's rights. And I'll, if I can go ahead and answer that, and then I'm going to leave. But I, you, you are so very right. 
and it, 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 you know, it reminds me of like the 50s and the whole, um, I'm tired, mentally tired, but you know what I'm talking about, the whole... Uh, McCarthyism. McCarthyism, right, thank you. <laughs> um, you know, uh, I'm calling on, and I think, you know, I want to do it more explicitly, and you know, this paper, I did it very quickly, and I want to do it, it would probably, um, at least in the end, beef up the end, but I'm calling on civil rights organizations to claim these issues as their issues. You know, it shouldn't just be the ACLU, you know, there should be a chorus of voices against this kind of uh, ugliness, you know, because it, we, we, we aspire to have a culture in which any group, you know, all, you know, uh, status groups are welcome, you know, and I, I also want to include the LBGT community in my paper, right? Um, and we, we have to be explicit and intentional about this. Um, you know, I'm sort of in a, uh, a, a, an island. I'm in a law school that's separate from the main campus. I hear about these things, but I haven't been, I, I've been fortunate to be in an institution where that kind of thing and culture hasn't happened. But I hope that if I were, I would be brave enough to stand up and say, this is wrong. And, and, and be part, but you have to be as intentional and, you, and you know, we have to be as intentional in building coalitions to counteract this kind of stuff or you know, you'll get more of the same. Thank you. We have more questions, but I think you can save them for the breakout groups. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry? Okay. Okay. I don't know whether you're actually interested in this, but I pulled this out for another purpose. Uh, I uh -huh. get you. No, it's but great.